الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وصلي عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملأ العالمين رب العالمين So we're continuing in the Quran here um, which is the 23rd ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah and we got together here um, to basically um, assess the prophetic challenge that the Prophet ﷺ was sent with a revelation and some miraculous signs and there was one specific standout challenge that he uh, posed in the scripture that was given to him uh, to the Arab people. So before we get into that, we have to understand a very important part of the history of prophets and why messengers were sent with specific kind of signs. Um, so for example, in the time of Moses, the Pharaoh of Egypt uh, was, was seen as a mystical God entity with a lowercase g. And so they uh, presented themselves as these, and they had like the, the sorcerer, the head sorcerer would be usually around them. And there were these magicians and sorcerers all over that had this mystical uh, soothsayers, kahana, and all of these things. They were there. So when God sends Moses, uh, the way he sends him signs is something that everybody there would say this is above and beyond something that we know as magic or sorcery, right? So that's when the uh, crux of the scenario came down, when the turning point of the whole story comes, is when Pharaoh, after he's been seeing some of these signs, people are starting to be like, wow, look at this Moses guy, his, his brother Aaron, this is pretty intense. So, he said, gather all of the most well-known, proficient sorcerers and magicians. Bring them here. Bring a good, solid group of them. And we will show that we are the true sorcerers. Basically what he's saying is, Moses is some sort of a low-level sorcerer, magic guy. We're going to prove that we've got all that stuff. That's fair, right? And he, knew, he thought that because that, I mean, that was something they knew. They had it. So then, they came. And a lot of people misunderstand these ayahs because it says that Moses was commanded to throw his, or Moses was commanded to tell them to go ahead and throw yours down when all of the group came. So they did, and they threw all their sticks down, and then it says, and it, all their sticks turned into some snakes that looked like they were moving around. Everybody was all amazed at this, whole bunch of them. Whatever Moses had done before, they have all recreated that. One. So now what is Moses? And it says that Moses, in and of himself, was scared. There's nothing wrong with saying this. It's a fact. Because he's a human, as all prophets are human. Sometimes they have certain feelings and things like that. It happens. So then God says, no, go ahead and throw your stick down. He did it and it says, تَلْقَفُوا مَا يَكْفِكُونَ Nowhere does it say in any ayah. And even most of the tafsirs confirm what I'm saying. Some tafsirs try to read into it what you've heard. That nowhere in any eye does it say that this stick actually became a snake. The literal meaning of the eye is that his stick, he threw it down, and the stick had a mouth. And then it swallowed up all their snakes. And then he went back to the stick as it was, same size and everything. And then he, he picked it back up. That's pretty impressive. Well, I heard, this is the first time I heard this one. Yeah. The first time I heard it was like, you know, actually turned into a snake. Exactly. So that the literal meaning of the ayah is his stick uh, became, uh, it became uh, a open container type thing, and then it just swallowed all of it up. But nowhere does it say it turned into a snake. Right? Like the first time when he was given this time, uh, like uh, God asked him to throw the stick, and he was afraid, and he uh, he tried. He, he he was like running away. So God said, like afraid not. So what was that like? Was that also uh, no, no, no. a stick? Or in a both stick? in both times before, it was a snake. Okay. Uh, let me let me let me retract for you, so you see what happens here. The first time he threw it down, and it became a snake, and he got scared. Oh my God. So then you tell them don't. Second time, it became a snake. Right? Third time, it doesn't say it became a snake. 
It says, فَإِذَاهِيَ تَلْقَفُ مَا يَأْفِكُونَ This, this staff uh, went down and it... Uh, beca yeah, because uh, Thu'ban is a masculine. Thu'ban al it's a masculine word. So you have to say, يَلْقَفُ Right? The word says, تَلْقَفُ which is feminine, which asa, staff, is a feminine word. So, I mean, this is when you study tafsir a lot, you come to new things, right? Because you've been hearing the, the cultural hand-me-down forever. Which some small group of mufassirin said, well, it must have become a snake because that's how it was before. And so even though the literal meaning is that he just threw it down, maybe that's just God decided not to say it became a snake. Um, but I think it's actually more impressive that he just his stick actually just ate up all these snakes. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I mean, a big snake eating up little snakes, okay, that's normal. We see anaconda eating up the garden snakes, no problem, right? But a stick eating snakes, I'm pretty, I'm saying that's more of a miracle. What would you think? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think we're all going to be more of a miracle. Yeah. So that's Moses' time. So then what they say? They went down in prostration, all those sorcerers. Now these are the ones that Moses brought. And what they're saying is, here's what they're saying. We are sorcerers by trade. That's what we've been doing. We've been learning the magic. We understand how, how it works, what you say, how you do what you do. Is it sleight of hand? Is it not? Whatever. They know all that stuff. They're saying this is not magic. They're saying this is not what magic is. It's very different. Whatever he said he's saying, that he is, that's true. He's the messenger of God. So that's Moses. Then in the Jesus' time, if you study back into Greek medicine and healing and, and the beginning of alchemy and things like that, you'll find that in Greece, who was the actual rulers of Byzantium, which uh, in that area, actually the Roman Empire still back then, they, uh, they, uh, they've started to take a new route of medical rather than mystical cures from like things. So they're like, they're saying, we now know medicine. We're doing medicine now. And you'll find out that they've developed things even for like healing, like the cast and things like that. They've, they've started to develop a more scientific approach to medicine. For it. So then Jesus comes and God's like, okay, um, take some uh, dirt, spit on it and put it in the eye. And the, the blind person will start to explain how they see everything. We all know this person's blind their whole life. And now they're seeing and the lepers had this disease that's eating away at their whole body. And then he would go, just touch them, bismillah, and then now the whole thing just slowly deteriorates. Then they were like, oh, this is magic. So then finally the, the, the drum roll, he said, okay, take me to someone that has died recently. And they are like, what? He said, yeah, take me to some God is commending me to call forth a dead man. So they said, okay, there's a tomb over there. And there's a guy named Lazarus who died a few days ago, three days. He's stiff as a board. He's dead, according to all accounts. So he says, Bismillah, he calls out, Lazarus, come up, wake up, Lazarus. And that whole village became believers, except for a couple of shady Levites, or Sadducees, you know, these rabbis that want to keep their authority and power. He said, what? Lazarus just walked out, came out, Looking like he was just a million bucks. What? <laughs> Lazarus! So that was a big deal. And that proved to them that whatever they know about medicine, this is beyond medicine. Healing a dead person? You have help, okay, maybe somebody got better uh, magically or something. This is a dead guy. There's no way to explain it except for whatever he said. God has power of everything and he sent him and that's where this miracle is coming from. That's all we know. It makes sense. So in the time of the Prophet the uh, Arabs were at a pinnacle part of their history. And they've been around for some hundreds of years in the area, uh, you know, in this poetic movement. They, well, there's something called Buhur al the, um, the They call them the oceans. <laughs> what they are is structured systems of poetic cadence. That's the best way to put it. So it'd be like, you know, like it's like the nursery rhyme, you know, like they're like, da 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 
uh, so there would be a structure to it, and it would end this way, it would be like this. So there was like, you know, another they call maqamat, but each one had their own, and the Arabs had developed and refined this, this poetic thing. Um, and so there was something called mu'allaqat, that in the last hundred years before the Prophet Sallallahu birth, after the, and it's very interesting because after the, the, the elephant from Abra, so after that miraculous event, which in and of itself, this part of the Quran is a miracle because the Arabs were making all kind of accusations against the Prophet ﷺ. The Quraysh had all these arguments. Never did they say, yeah, he's teaching everybody about some crazy story with the elephant and then it happened like this and then they threw around all these things. That's nonsense. You know, most people know if they read that, that's just some ridiculous mythological folklore. But everybody knew that that was it. All the Arabs agreed that that happened. That was, their, that was a point in history where they would say, I was born this many years, this many years before, after the elephant, right? That's, that's part of their history. So after that miraculous event, these mu'allaqat were very well documented. What this means, mu'allaqat, the attachments. What it is is certain poets, and many people said those poets are inspired by jinns, spirits. And so these poets would put thousand line poems on like a leather, a piece of leather, or a really, you know, flat, uh, solid tree bark or something. They'll, they will put it up, uh, hammer it up against the Kaaba. And it would stay on the side of the Kaaba <coughs> for a long time. People would go and memorize it. People would go in over there praying to their gods and then learning this, thinking that this poem is now gaining holy powers. Right? They had this in their mind. So... The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was one of those who were never sitting with the poets. He never, nobody ever accused him of being a poet or sitting with poets or learning from poets. Much less learning how to write his own name. He was not a literary guy. He was not, you know, like Umar ibn Khattab, Uthman ibn Affan. Some of the very Ali ibn Talib, some of the very wealthy people ended up learning how to write because their family was very rich and wealthy, and they were part of that five to ten percent of society that learned reading and writing. Most people, they didn't need it. They had a very strong command of language, and people told stories and memorized things very abundantly. You know, some would say, how do they memorize? You can remember, you know, those of us that are at least mid-30s, you know, if you're that young. You can remember back before cell phones. You know, when I was in high school, there was no such thing as cell phones. And we memorized like 20, 30 telephone numbers. Every number I know, addresses I memorize, it, all that stuff. I could get to places by remembering when you turn here, you turn there, and I don't know the name of the streets. I just remember what it looked like. Now, without this phone, I don't know anybody's number, and I'm not getting where I'm going. Okay? I gotta push the button. So, when the human being, it's just like somebody who loses their sight, their hearing amplifies. It's just the way God created us. We got sent up to Right? So the Arabs were master memorizers, two reasons. Number one, nobody was literate. Number two, their language is poetic by nature. And then they put things in poetic structures that were very beautiful and well cadenced and easy to memorize. You know, when you study Sharia, you actually have to learn all these poems and stuff. Because they're the root of the Arabic language and you will start to see the miracle of the Quran when you study those. Because they're profound. Out of a thousand line poem, Wisdom and guidance-wise, you may get like five, ten verses you'll memorize for the rest of your life. The rest of it, you'll say, it flowed pretty nice. It's a nice song type thing. But other than that, it's like some guy's words, some lady's words, some opinions, stuff like that. Some, you know, it's not some big life-changing, heart-moving reality, right? So, then the Prophet them, orphan, nobody wanted him. Uncle, the first grandpa, uncle, took care of him, mom died and everything. He was a shepherd, herding, you know, family stuff, which is the lowly job. Nobody wants to be a shepherd, right? You can go walking through, do, do, and all that kind of stuff. You're all professional. Feces and urine. I have little kids, man. I'm stuck with this little lingu linguistic thing. <laughs> So, uh, he did that, he became a merchant, started learning the business trade. He wasn't wealthy, it's not like he had all this money to invest. My son came and told me that he was at the school and the history book, he said he went ahead to the Islam section just to see. <laughs> he read through it. And they said, because when we get there, I'm going to go visit. It says, Muhammad was a very wealthy investor who had 
big business trade that he owned and commended and he spent a lot of time in the Christian Syrian realm. You know, they're developing this this false narrative which is nowhere said in any scripture or even the anti-Muslim biographies of the Prophet. Don't try to make this ridiculous claim. It's there in the textbook, which is another point. Many influential people write textbooks because that's a good way to get in somebody's brain and mold them from a young age about certain issues about world history or, or uh, American history or about uh, the legal system or the politics or whatever. Anyway, back to our point. So the Prophet when he first starts, you know, getting these revelations, he started telling people about them. And they were like, and the eyes, you know. They think about what they mean and what profound influence just these first few verses have. And then when they learn about the other ones and they see the movement of the soul and the mind and the connection of the spiritual and the intellectual and the, the connection of, of purpose and meaning and, and ultimate accountability and it was just something huge, profound. So that's what we can talk about. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإن كنتم في ريب مما نزلنا على عبدنا فأتوا بصورة من مثله. So this one, the beginning of it, it says. And by the way, just so you remember the last ayat, the the first ayat, two ayats ago, what we did yesterday, it was God reaching out to human beings after explaining what does it mean to have faith and connection with God, what are your characteristics, what is a disbeliever, and what is a hypocrite. He clarified the three realities that, that have to do with faith, how every heart is in one of these three categories. And then he appeals to all the hearts, I'm the one created you, provided you, took care of you since day one, all of everyone that you ever knew in the history of existence, all derived everything from me. And right now, you're living on this canopy, on this comfortable place of living called earth that I have made easy for you to get whatever you need. Whatever you're going to need is going to come to you right at your fingertips. And I've made sure that there is a protective ceiling over you. You know? And then he said, and then I will bring up the, the fruits and I will distribute the rain all over the place and it will bless everyone. So now he's like, okay, he's made his proof that you can see with your eyes. Now he said, about this guy that's around you. Okay? If you're in doubt concerning the revelation we have sent down to our servant, then produce a chapter like it. This is the argument. Now most non-Muslims and most, I mean, many, many rational Muslims, modern Muslims, whatever, if you say this, it's like, okay, we know we're supposed to believe that or whatever, but it sounds corny. Like, write a book and show me how your chapter is so amazing. It's like, what kind of a miracle is that, right? If you don't know the uh, profoundness uh, of this book and compared to previous well-established, uh, seemingly mystically touched by spirits in the other world around us, um, there's, a, there's a very obvious difference. But we're going to talk about how it's a little bit deeper than just that. That is obviously part of the intended meaning. But it doesn't say, do you see it saying here, um, produce a chapter like it in its beautiful Arabic eloquence? Do you see that part there? You've been told that a million times. And it is part of the issue. But it's not the whole issue and it's not the majority of the issue. It's a small part of the point, right? People get, you know, sometimes you get bothered. I'm always bringing different ideas they never heard before. <laughs> well, that's why we came here. When you study tafsir, you know, most of it should be guidance in putting a system of life in which I know God, I know myself, I know my enemy and the devil, and I'm in a process of being conscious of my purpose. But also you should know uh, the breadth and the richness of, of a scholarly understanding of the Qur'an rather than just a basic, whatever we heard growing up type thing uh, that we get used to. So, as we see, obviously it's a ma mainly a challenge to the Arabs, who were a people very proud of their language, as we talked about. Um, it was a means of so social representation and influence. So, every tribe has the poet. The poet is literally the medium. The poet is the CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, BBC. That's what they are. And if they're out of line, some powerful chief or figure will remove them and put the new one up that is going to... So the poet is supposed to go to the marketplace, to go to the Kaaba and Hajj, and to present 
the, 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 what they call the, the fakhri, the pride of the tribe, who we are, how much wealth, how courage we are, how we take care of ours, and when they die, we saddened about their whole thing and all this deep, beautiful stuff. That was the poet. It was a very instrumental part of the tribal system. The poet spoke on behalf of the people and it made a big deal that, that our poet has to be special, right? So the Prophet Sallallahu actually, as we will see, all of the poets from Abdul Muttalib became Muslim, which is a sign. Because they're from Abdul Muttalib. They're the poets from his tribe. If he was secretly learning poetry from them, they'd be like, yeah, this kid was always at our house learning all that stuff. He just uh, kind of tweaked it a little bit. And, no. They were like, wow, Muhammad? The guy was a you know, young orphan boy? Now he's doing this? Let's listen. They learned it. <laughs> Check it out. I'm pretty sure they didn't say that. But huh? <laughs> Why not? They're like, you know, why would he have some great poetry? There's no reason. Then when they heard it, they're like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, inshallah, mashallah, was something very much instituted by the Prophet. Oh, man. Okay. We got, so we got 20 minutes. Okay, so uh, so it was a challenge to whoever would doubt the source of the Quran. This was saying these chapters hold all kind of miraculous things in them. The Quran is a multifaceted miracle. It's not a one side. It is a one size fits all. It's not a one monolith grammar or eloquence or poetic cadence. That's one part. One part of it is. Millions of, pe millions of people throughout world history have memorized it front to back and most of them did not understand Arabic. Wow. That's pretty profound. You know, I've been, one time I was uh, in Kuwait and some young African boy, the most beautiful Qara I've ever met. And so I went up to him talking to him. He had some broken, you know, he's been living in Kuwait for some reason. Uh, and I was like, you read like that and you don't even, you know, he's not like pronouncing it almost. Like when he's talking Arabic, like it's like all mixed up. When he's reading the Quran, it's like the most beautiful thing you ever heard. Allah mm -hmm. From Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And that's the, how it is. This is a miracle. So, uh, it is mostly in my humble assessment, the Quran's miracle is in that this statement was made and then all the people of Arabia 23 years later became Muslim. Everyone who spoke that language became Muslim by the time he was done. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I challenge anybody to recreate this thing. Go and write a book somewhere in Peru in Spanish or Russia in some small district or whatever. Go somewhere in China, write you a book. God has sent me a message. And then convince the whole entire place to become Muslim in 23 years. It's not going to happen. That's the biggest miracle out there. Because it proved that those who knew this were not able to prove it wrong. See, it's easy to stand out here as an outsider. And outsiders are not just not Arabs. Arabs today do not speak Arab, Arabic like this book back then. You know. And I got to a taxi cab in Egypt once. I asked... لو سمحت أخي العزيز أريد أن أذهب إلى السوق بإذن الله. And the brother looked at me and said, صدق الله العظيم يا أخي ما شاء الله. Let me translate what just happened. So I said, uh, my dear friend, can you please take me to the marketplace by the will of God? He said, صدق الله العظيم. Because the way that sounds is like the Quran to him. And nobody talks like that in Egypt. <laughs> Which is basic Arabic. It's just like pure Quranic Arabic, what we learned, you know. And uh, so, yeah. So, uh, as a law system. So, the Prophet ﷺ lives in an anarchy society. Anarchy. Tribal anarchy. Each tribe has its own little loose set of rules that they break because who has power and what interests we have, why are we going to break the laws and rules and change things around. If this tribe doesn't like that tribe's rules or ideas, they'll do this, and kill a couple of people, stab them up, put them off to the side of the road. There's no police, there's no legal system of any sort, there's no kingdom, right? Yeah, it was lawlessness. 
And so, uh, the Prophet is getting these revelations about law. 23 years later, they went from one way to a, the whole, it's, it's not just some people, the whole entire Arabian Peninsula went from polytheist to monotheist. They went from tribal anarchy to, and I'm going to say this exactly as the Prophet left it, a executive, judicial, and legislative branch of government. Sound familiar? Okay. He left it like that. Those things were understood in that way by the Prophet and emphasized heavily by Umar ibn Khattab, which is the basis of our modern democratic system that we have without the full authority, even though now they're trying to do that, as we see with this crazy orange in the White House. The kids call him Cheeto. Cheeto in charge. See, I see. So, um, the law system. They went from gambling was a hallmark of the Arabian society. No such thing as gambling, 23 years. Alcohol was on every corner. Mecca had bars on every corner in the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr and Omar talk about, Abu Bakr said one time, I was walking away from the Kaaba and I saw a guy eating his feces. He came out of a bar. I knew then I would never drink anything as a young man. Now, Abu said, that's the reason why I never drank alcohol. Right? That was normal. 23 years, there's n nobody drinks alcohol. I mean, if they did, it was very secretive and they felt bad about it. It was commonplace. Back then, prostitution, normal. Add that, the beauty of marriage. Women were seen as like property and things like that. Now, they're an honored, respected part of society, our mothers and all of this, that we want to preserve and protect. All kind of things. There was oppression as standard points. We do honor on this point. The legal teachings of the Quran and how they transformed not only Arabia, but influenced the modern world we live in. And this is not just my claim as the Imam who's, you know, so into his religion and fooled by his faith or whatever. This is PhDs written all over the United States and England and Switzerland and places, Australia about the amazing influence of Spanish Muslims, of Iraqi Muslims, of Muslims in India to... I mean, what is this letters? Look at these numbers. One, two, three, four, five. The Muslims took them from the Indian people and standardized them. One, two, three, four, five. This one. And that was in the Caliphate. The Romans had like one, two, three, and then V, and then this one. You can't do math with it. It's very difficult to do any sophisticated math. Muslims invented math with one, two, three, so then they, they all adopted this because of that. This is our world. I don't mean to sound arrogant or something like that. But Allah has blessed us. This is Khilafah. Khilafah is not about killing people and taking them over. It's about showing our values. People say, wow, that system is real. Well, maybe I don't believe in everything about it, but I can appreciate it. This is our core values. This is our mission and vision. You see what I'm saying? So, then uh, spirituality. People used to not believe in a hereafter. They were all deeply believing in the hereafter. What's the main proof? Everybody that was ever with the Prophet Muhammad, people wanted to erase Islam from Arabia, and they were attacking them, humiliating them, they were willing to go through everything. The mother and father of Ammar bin Yasir, if they had any doubt about this message in this hereafter that is very new to their society, they would have said, hold on, I just believe. But they were willing to die. When these armies came from the Quraysh and that to kill the Muslims, Everybody's ready and willing and excited to go die in the path of God, defending the rights of the Muslims to believe and to exist in their society. This is obvious proof that they knew that this message is real. So the spirituality was very amazing. And influence, as we said. The Prophet ﷺ says, in the in Bukhari, all prophets were given miracles that led to their people believing in them. I was given this revelation that Allah revealed to me, and I hope I have the most followers because of it. Now, that's a statement. It's a prophecy, isn't it? What's the prophecy? I have the most followers. Here we are, 14 centuries later, all over the world, there's Muslims, there's like 1.6 billion. That's what he was saying. And if you ask anyone of them, what makes you Muslim? It's the Quran. We read the Quran all the time. We have Qurans in every mosque. We all know it. If you go to Turkey, you'll meet people who are not Arabs. They know how to recite and draw the calligraphy of the Quran better than anybody on planet Earth. 
And they were the rulers of all of the Muslims for 7th century, 8th century. It's not an Arab religion. It's not about Arab. It's not about culture. Whoever will come and appreciate it and follow it and you know, live it, they will, they will shine. So this doesn't mean that he was not given other miracles, by the way. So some of you might say, are you trying to say that there was no other miracles? There's many. I have a, a master's thesis, thousand miracles of the Prophet, done by a student of Medina. And I'm blown away reading all of these. The miracle here is talking about for the non-Muslims. There were only two miracles given to the non-Muslims that were blatant and obvious. It was the Qur'an and the splitting of the womb. Outside of those two, there was thousand miracles for believers to have strong faith and patience and fortitude in their certainty. So many things. Prophet knew this was going to happen, that was going to happen. The water came out, the food was for a thousand people. Uh, the rain came down for months when he asked for it. All this stuff. That all happened. They all witnessed it many, many, many times again over and over and over. That was for Tathbit Iman al-Mu'min, to establish the believer's faith. So this was the challenge. As every prophet comes with a miracle to the non-Muslims say, look, you guys are saying he's not real. You prove it. Here's what it is. So it says, So call upon your witnesses. The, command, the, the challenge is telling the Arabs of, of Quraysh and anybody until the Day of Judgment, whoever else is challenging this, and bring your witnesses beside God if you are truthful. Witnesses are those who would themselves say, and we've brought this chapter and it's like the Qur'an. And then the other part of the witnesses, the people who all say, we agree that's like that. How many of you heard about the Furqan? Furqan al-Haq. You know what I'm talking about? Furqan al-Haq. You heard about this book? By Anish Sharosh. I've heard about the word, not Okay. So uh, this is what's amazing. Anish Sharosh was the guy that debated Ahmed Dida three times. And two times it was really unfortunate for this program. Two times he got obliterated. The third time he got his stuff together, understanding the nature of debate, and he kind of thought about Ahmed Dida's points and tried to come with some points that seemed to be clever. But the first two, it was a disaster. Anisha Rose looked like he didn't even know his own religion. Okay? He's a Christian uh, Palestinian, by the way. But he became an evangelical American. He's one of those that came to America and became a big rich guy from this, right? So Anish Sharosh got together with a bunch of Christian Arabs and they say in seven days. But I'm remembering back when they did the debate about the Qur'an. For, that was a long time ago. He's been working on this for a long time. So he brought forth his Furqan al-Haq, the true criterion. And he came, and it was a big deal because I, I was in Egypt whenever they had it. Egypt, the Ministry of Religious Affairs said this book is prohibited to come in here. And I was telling my Egyptian brothers, why are y'all acting like that? You scared he's going to prove the Qur'an wrong now? What the heck's wrong with you? And this is where Muslims have this strange insecurity in their religion. Oh, don't let my, my kids be around the non-Muslims, maybe he will lose his way. Well, if you don't know what you're talking about and you don't know Islam, then that's your fault. <laughs> he's going to find out one way or another if he doesn't have the right understanding. He's going to lose it from somewhere or another or in his own mind or become a hypocrite. No, be, know that the truth is there and do your best and that's and the rest is in God's hands. So, um, Kuwait was the only country that invited it. Kuwait brought it in, and they had a whole scholarly panel to discuss it, and they picked it apart, ayah ayah. And they proved that the vast majority of this book, because I've read it, the vast majority of this book is they'll pick some statements that are in the Qur'an, in the exact same form of the Qur'an, and then they'll throw in some Christian teachings or some anti-Muslim teaching in the middle of it. You know, and every one, every chapter begins, Bismillah, Ibn Waruh al Qudus, and all that. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> a lot of Muslims are like, see, we call him Allah, and everybody knows the Deccan. No, every Christian thinks Allah is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They have the same problem. You can't use a word and fix this. It's a concept, you're going to have to define who is God, who is Allah, who is Dios, who is God, who is whatever you're going to call him. Yahweh, you know. You got to define it as a believer, as all prophets did to their people. <laughs> Because everybody's going to bring their stuff into it. You know, you heard of Malaysia? Are you from Indonesia? Or Malaysia? Korea next door, dude. <laughs> I just look like a racist idiot right now. <laughs> Please forgive me, sister. But the, and this is, you know, I was born in Oklahoma. I'm just white thing. Oh, those are all like that, you know. <laughs> 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 
So within Malaysia, they made a rule. No non-Muslims can call God Allah. You didn't hear about this? It's a law. If you're a non-Muslim in Malaysia and you say Allah, they will find you or something. <laughs> so that's our word. You can't, because you're using it for missionary work. That's what they're doing. They're writing Malay books and they're putting Allah in there with Christian stuff. Because they know that's going to make them... That's deceiving. They've figured out, you know... So call upon your witnesses. So the fact that none of you know about Fuqal Haq, that was done in the year 2005, it was a big deal. Here we are 12 years later and it's an afterthought. It was a huge effort! And if you read through it and you don't know anything about Islam, you'll think it's the Qur'an. If you're a Muslim, secular Muslim, don't know nothing, if you heard it recited, you might think that's the Qur'an. You will think that's the Qur'an. You will send your brother, brother, we'll be doing Furqan al-Haq here in the Maghrib Salat. But I mean... Yeah. You know, one time the Sheikh said, many people want to bring the Qur'an down just to a melody. He was like, but one time I was telling him, I was like, listen, man. لَقَدْ جَاءَ أَحْمَدُ مِنَ السُّوْقِ فَقَالَ لِأُخْتِهِ يَا أُخْتِ أُحِبُّكِ فِي اللَّهِ I just now made a sentence from my mind. It's called tajweed. It's not divine what I'm doing. No, I'm just saying. Sheikh Muhammad Arifi made this point. Very famous Saudi scholar. You need to quit doing that. Anybody from the ICC is here, they're going to record it. I'll pull up Muhammad Arifi. He has like 8 million Twitter followers, a famous scholar, everybody knows him. He made this point that many people think Tajweed is like a thing from the Quran, even though it's very important and all Muslims should learn it. They think that that's the miracle of the Quran. It's much deeper than that, is our discussion today. It's much deeper than that. It's much more. So. Uh, after that, he says, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةُ عِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ If you're not able to bring some chapter that looks like the Qur'an, and you will not be able to, which is a challenge, that nobody will do it. Say somebody came and had this whole faction of many people in Arabia that said, like it happened, Musaylam al-Kadhab said, I had Qur'an. He was an Arab guy from a village called Yaman. And he had a whole village of like 25, 30,000 people that said he's a prophet and he has Qur'an. Right? And he was doing what this is asking for. And during the time of the prophet, for like the last five years, it started to grow. And that's where the prophet called him Kaddab. Right? After the prophet ﷺ died, his village said, Musaylama is the new prophet. And so Abu Bakr had to go send an army to them because your village had committed as believers, okay, in general, and Musaylam was trying to join the Prophet, and we did not accept him as joining the Prophet. Right? And so then the Yamama was Muslim, and you had committed to the whole land, and everybody's saying they're Muslim. They said, well, now we want Musaylam as the new Prophet. We want him to be the authoritative. We can do his Qur'an instead of your Qur'an. In one battle that took about a week and a half, and that was done. There was no Musaylam and Kaddab after that. He's known in history as Musaylam the liar, and nobody can remember anything from his Qur'an. I think I, I did remember some of it. <laughs> He says, الفيل والفيل وما أدراك ما الفيل له خرطوم طويل It sounds so funny. He's like, the elephant, the elephant. What would you know what an elephant is? He has a very long snout. <laughs> <laughs> that was his Qur'an he was teaching. Oh my God. So, uh, Amr al whenever he heard his Qur'an, he came to him and said, look, Musaylama, I just want you to know. I know that your village sees you as a very powerful man and they respect you. I've listened to your Qur'an and I've listened to Muhammad's Qur'an. You and I both know you're a liar. <laughs> and he said, what? He said, you know that just as well as I know that you are a liar making all this nonsense up. And he was a Muslim at the time, by the way. And he was telling the people of Quraysh, this guy's an idiot, don't even, don't even make an alliance with him. There's no barakah there. So... Uh, so then he says, uh, this is the hellfire fueled by man and stones prepared for the disbelievers. That's what will happen for one who would challenge prophethood and fail, which many people have in history. So uh, its fuel is people and sulfur, brimstone. As people were walking around, uh, they, they will be walking around, and as they walk on this brimstone, 
fire will ignite their whole body and burn all their skin off. This is what the scholars said based upon the different hadith. The word kafir here, or iddat lil kafirin. So here, you guys all memorize the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah, right? We're doing with our kids every time we go to sleep. One sunnah, ala al kafirin, right? Support us against who? The disbelievers. Does that mean all disbelievers? I mean my neighbor at work and my neighbor in the neighborhood? I, I want Allah to give me victory over him? Does the word kafirin always mean someone who is just not a Muslim? No, for sure we know that. For sure. First of all, al kafirin, kafir is a big word. And it carries varying levels and degrees of meaning. So, someone, the literal meaning of, of kafir, kufran al nirma, to be ungrateful, to reject favors that have been done to you and to act like you don't care. This is kufran al nirma. This is the essence of kufr. So, the idea is the word cover in English. Is actually taken from the Arabic word kafa. So, to conceal. So, the idea is inside and around you, you're aware of divine favor and blessing that you are living in, that you exist upon. So, to reject the need to serve God is this selfish concealing and covering up of those truths. So, that's what this uh, kufr is. Here it's talking about. Those people who reject the prophets and work against them. Because who is it talking to? The Quraysh who said you're a liar and a fool and a possessed maniac. They were saying that. That's why this Quran is telling them, okay, well then here's what you should say. So it's not saying all people who are just not Muslim are going to go through this hellfire like that. God knows what's going to happen to every individual and you're exposed to certain levels of faith. We were talking about it earlier. So that's where we don't want to be like, everybody's doomed to hell because they're not Muslim. That is a very uh, void of nuance understanding. People are responsible for their level of interaction with true prophethood and knowledge and understanding thereof. And they will be judged accordingly in the hereafter. The fact that the Prophet was illiterate emphasizes this whole point. The Quran says that, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَكْتَ وَمَا كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِ You can't write. The Quran said that about it. You, you didn't know anything about writing or faith or a book of scripture. You didn't know anybody. The Quran is saying that. Had anybody have said, yeah, we knew he could read and write, and he was learning from these people about faith and religion and scriptures, then they would have brought that. They didn't. The only story about someone teaching him is a Persian guy. If you study the, the one that says, A'ajami, or Arabi, he's teaching you a book in Arabic you know. If he would have told you in some foreign language, nobody would have cared, right? That's why we Muslims need to tone down all of our Arabic words while talking English. The Quran is saying it's not a good way to make da'wah, right? You need to learn English words and talk to people in English. So, uh, that tafsir is that the Quraysh said, we saw him sitting with that Persian guy who tells stories. And that guy tells all these stories about Ad and Thamud. That's the extent of the argument. Nobody said he sat with Jews and Christians and learned their message. That is an fabricated story. No Jews were even saying this. Jews were saying he should not know, and that's why they brought their argument. There's no way he'll know this. Because they know he never sat with them. So the last one is beautiful. وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِ مِنْ تَحْتِ مَنْ آمَنُوا In the Qur'an, any time, he gives a warning, he will give a glad tidings. It's called tibaq in Arabic. In Arabic, there's this eloquent system that to emphasize points with opposites. Okay, this is like that, and then this is like that. Don't put yourself in the gray area. These are some serious things. Try to put yourself on the side that you know is better. You can feel, you know that's the way I should be. So as for those who have attained good faith and they worked righteousness, they will have gardens which is a blissful world with rivers flowing around it, right? So this is uh, the idea of faith. So somebody said once, I heard the Quran says you can have whatever you want in Jannah, right? It says many times in the Quran exactly like this, right? They have whatever they want. Why does it always say the same phrase, gardens with rivers flowing around it? Some of the Quran is indeed 
igniting and inciting the faith of the Arabs to whom it was first revealed to in their language. If you're living in the desert, the most beautiful thing is a garden. If you live in New Zealand, the garden is normal. It's not some big deal. Right? So you're going to have to make a tafsir of this ayah in some way that the New Zealand people, whatever they want to see. Yeah, you got to bring something for them. <laughs> So that's why that's like that. It's just the uh, enticing. Maybe we would all say that we appreciate it. Faith and good deeds are separable. Inseparable. So you have these modern people. This is the new thing. I have a good heart. I mean good. I'm a good person. But I don't really want to learn and follow God's message and His religion. I don't want to pray and do all that. I read lots of prayer and go to the mosque and things like that. I'm a good person. Okay. Problem is with that. It's conflicting with what the prophet who did miracles, many, has said this is how you should be living and acting. So when you're in conflict with, so we're just going to take somebody's opinion and everybody can just make up for this. Why did we send prophets with miracles, with books, if you can just be a good person because my heart, I've decided. So people don't realize secular liberalism is saying, cancel revelation, you don't need it. Become part of the entertainment structure. Make us millions and billions of dollars and go along with everything. Buy all this food that will also help the health industry. See, it's all the interconnected capitalist system. It's all about removing spiritual, moral values that will protect society and keep it in good shape, keep it cohesive. That's the divine truth. The evil truth is we worship money. And that's what they're doing. And so they're just, people don't realize, I have a good heart. And many things they do and say cause all kinds of problems. They don't realize it. Uh, the rivers flow without any ditches. That's just uh, because it says, uh, here's what, the, I don't know why I'm making this point. It's in the tafsir, okay? Some people say, the, how is it that there is tajri min tahtiha? Tahti what? The gardens. Under gardens are rivers. What is that? Is there a river and then there's a garden up there? Right? So the scholars felt the need to address this point. Right? What is that? How does that work? So what they said was, rivers just flow, and it's not like there's a ditch. You know what I'm saying? That's what they said. It's just like rivers are right there. Right? And they can go under gardens and everything. No problem. And if you go in there, it seems like it's, it's empty, but if you want to stand on top of it, you can stand on top of it. It's like some miraculous you know, thing, you know? It's whatever you want it to be, and it's so beautiful and pure and clean. Right? Whatever the shortcomings are with this realm that we live in, all of that is a race which creates very different, interesting scenarios. Right, that we, that's why the Quran says, فِيهَا مَا لَا رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمْعَتْ وَلَا خَطَّرَ عَلَى بَارِ بَشَرٌ In heaven are things that your eye has never even seen or fathomed of seeing. And in the uh, heaven is things your ears have not even fathomed of hearing. And things that your mind could not even conceive. So that's what brings us to the next uh, part of this. كُلَّمَا رُزِقُوا مِنْهَا مِنْ ثَمَرَةِ الرِّزْقًا قَالُوا هَذَا الَّذِي رُزِقُنَا مِنْ قَبْلِ وَأُتُوا بِهِ مُتَشَابِهَا This is the point. So whenever they take its fruits, they say, this is like what we had before. In fact, they're giving something similar. So what they'll say is, they'll remember back the apple, or the pear, or the orange, or the grape from this world. But in this world, there were different colors. This one's sweet, that one's not sweet, all of that. Over there, each one is shining and just beautiful and just the juiciest thing. You just bite into it, and then it's just pure and perfect. If you let it sit, it looks the same. It doesn't start to get... You see what I'm saying? So the, when they said, be mutashabiha, it seemed a little bit like it, but now they're in experiencing a whole new world and a whole new realm of perfection and beauty and comfort, and that's how it is. The color and shape will be similar in size, but the taste will be amazing. This is the tough seal, what they say. So there's no bad or bruised fruits, no sour, or anything like that. No need to discard anything. Whatever you like, there's not, not like that part, you know, like the, the stem or whatever. It's all the same. It's all good. You're not going to be like, oh, I'm going to throw that, right? Oh, that part I don't like. I don't need it. You'll like everything. Everything will be perfect, right? You'll never get bored or used to it, right? One lady once, she was arguing with me at the church, she said, Ima, if everything's perfect in heaven, won't it just get boring? I said, man, what are you talking about? 
She's like, yeah, it'll just become boring. You'll get used to it. You're thinking with the imperfection of this world that you live in. There are certain attitudes of depression, of sadness, of anger, of haste, of sickness, of confusion, of ignorance. All those are here. None of that is there. So the perfection you think you're understanding, you cannot understand until you're there, and that's why you have to work for it. وَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِرِينَ So, uh, the last one is, وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا أَزْوَاجٌ مُطَهَّرَةٌ وَهُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ They will have pure spouses in there, and they will dwell for eternity. What does this pure mean? It means there is no physical or spiritual impurities to these spouses. So, the scholars have differed. What does this azwaj mean? Azwaj is either your actual wife, or if you had more than one wife, you have more than one wife, or it's referring to some creation, this beautiful creation in heaven called Hurun Ain. Hurun Ain is basically some beautiful, nice, uh, looking women who are very nice and interactive and you can have some sort of interaction with them as you like, right? Some people say, this doesn't sound right. <laughs> some like the you know, type of thing you Muslims have. It seems like some man wrote this book. Number one, the flaws that we have in this life, like jealousy, don't exist there. So no wife would be like, how dare you look at that woman? She'll be like, look how beautiful she is. She'll be totally encouraging you. And now some of you, we have some kids in the room, so we can't give the full understanding of this. You're thinking about this relationship in terms of exchange of bodily fluids and all of these things. It's not like that. There is no uh, mucus and feces and urine and semen. All that doesn't exist in heaven. You're thinking about it in terms of a lowly, animalistic, worldly experience. Over there, there's no using the bathroom, there's no gas, there's no none of that. So whatever the relationship is, it's much different than this. And it's perfectly acceptable because people discipline themselves to have it. And I listened to Shaykh Khalid al Kuru was asked, Hafizullah Ta'ala, the woman asked, what if I want to be with Wildan al Mukhalladun? Because the tafsir says that very, mashallah, you know, men create young, young boys, teenage-like, Created in heaven, and they're serving you all the time. So if the woman said, "This guy, hot or whatever, you know, I like him." Lahum fiha ma yashaun. That's what. No man knows what I stuck for a lot. This is my woman. That mentality is a problem of the man on earth. He has limitations and covetousness in his mind. So the solution to this confusion of what heaven is like and how it should be is people are trying to judge eternal perfection of paradise with the imperfections of this world and those are apples and oranges not to be trying to make some funny pun so the last thing here says that once people enter heaven you will send out a caller no death from here eternity so that's our I think our final point is that this life is limited we're gonna die today tomorrow I'm blown away our dear brother let's all real quick just together inshallah Ya Allah Owner of everything in the universe, healer of the hearts, we ask you to give a speedy healing and complete recovery to our dear brother and Sheikh Osama Kanin. Relieve him of the Lou Gehrig disease, cure him and heal him of it, and bring him as a sign to the Muslim community of your great power and wisdom and ability. Osama Kanin is just, you know, I think he's not even my age. He was like almost 40. He got Lou Gehrig disease, ALS. You can't imagine that will happen. One in a hundred thousand or whatever it is. He's, he's expected by the science he will die within the next five years. Probably one or two years. We know Allah will cure him, inshallah. If that's what's best, that he is going to do it. And we will pray for it and believe it will happen. And we've seen these things happen. Right? So he, if, I'm going to send it out to our whole list. He gave a lecture last weekend that will lift your iman and root you in a way that you have not seen in a while. This is this was powerful. You really will taste faith by listening to this person who has just been told you're about to die. His level of connection with the scripture and the prophetic model and patience and fortitude it is fantastic. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us eternity in Jannah. So I was like, look, I'm sorry we went a little bit over here. Um, it was my fault. I was doing one point, we went on and on and on.
Is he allowed with minutes booked? Should we ask the question of should we do right after Monday or eight o'clock? We will after. Okay. We will pray, inshallah.